The show opened October 17 in New York. The press and public acclaimed it. But I watched the audiences. For example, they applauded in the middle of a sequence. The geniuses said that when you're selling out and turning people away from the box office, I shouldn't even change the ushers' uniforms. I went back to the coast and spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars and fixed it. There's only one genius that I had ever recognized, and that's the unconscious geniuses, as I call them, the public. You know, a lot of guys grow up and they want to become president of the United States. With me, I just wanted to grow up and marry Elizabeth Taylor. And I did. Our marriage ceremony was quiet and simple. But afterwards, Mike arranged a spectacular. Mike Todd doing his nut. I mean, we had firecrackers with M loves E and E loves M all over the sky. All of a sudden, the mountain became alive with exotic dancers doing a, a fertility dance. The party must have um, been rather bizarre to some onlookers because here was Mike Todd, uh, 20 years older than his bride. And his bride felt at that time about 90 years old because she was crippled and was in a metal sort of brace. And her groom, well, a 12-year-old in the height of um, activity. And his young bride was sort of hobbling along in her sort of wheelchair at the age of 24. And people were worried about her age difference. <laughs> As some of you know, I'm married to a girl who's a few years my junior. As a matter of fact, she's a few years my junior's junior. We traveled all over the world together to promote around the world in 80 days. Of course, we couldn't have gone more first class and we couldn't have had more of a ball. We arrived in Greece in our own plane and we opened the film, went through all the kind of hoopla and the ceremony of the uh, premiere with the royalty and it was terribly exciting. And, very glamorous. And then finally we lost everybody and we came, became the typical tourists. And I took home movies of Mike and he took home movies of me. I was hobbling around in the uh, Acropolis with one heel broken and Mike was posing me up against goddesses. Then we went to the Greek islands and we were riding around on donkeys. Well, we have the home movies of it. And they're like everybody else's home movies that are so bad, you wouldn't believe them. I mean, you couldn't believe that the man who did Around the World in 80 Days and Cinerama had anything to do with these home movies. But I must say, we had fun. Well, you know that Mike spoke no other language but English, and um, a lot of his English words were his own, his own invention, but it was it was curious, wherever he went, no matter what country we went to, he could always make himself understood to people that didn't speak English at all. One of the things about Mike that uh, continually fascinated me was his insatiable sense of curiosity and his interest in things, people, everything. For instance, when we would arrive in a foreign country, uh, after five minutes, Mike would know the population of the city, what the main industry was, what the best restaurants in town were, uh, how the political trend was swinging, and how the uh, public was satisfied with the way things were going, so forth and so on, which was uh, a remarkable kind of talent, a genius, really. <laughs> It says that it's impossible for me to pass a microphone. So can you imagine what it's like? To one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, we're really overwhelmed. Speaking for both of us, almost. I, I usually do. 
but we're really overwhelmed. Elizabeth, you thank say you. something. I never have a joke. chance to say anything. I've actually forgotten how to talk. But thank you. It's wonderful to be here. <laughs> Two more words. You wish you hadn't asked. I promise you. <laughs> I think 80 Days received something like 70 or 80 awards from all over the world. But my heart was really in my throat the night of the Oscars. When it was time for the Best Picture Award and they called me up, Without thinking, I ran to the platform and I grabbed it. I mean, I grabbed it. I won the two biggest prizes you can get. The Academy Award and Elizabeth Taylor. That's not bad for luck. In England, we had a nice crowd for the opening. There was a receiving line. We had royalty. And of course, I got Elizabeth a new party dress. Elizabeth enjoys shopping. It was very extravagant of me, but my greatest pleasure is buying her a little bauble or a picture to hang on the wall. Mike always gave a party every time he had a screening of Around the World in 80 Days. I had opened a small Chinese restaurant in Paris, and Mike was trying to be a big guy, so he said, I'll give the party in your restaurant. It only holds 36 people, I warned him. That's all I'm going to invite, he said. So sure enough, the picture was over, and 110 people showed up. And my Chinese manager didn't know what to do, so he decided to quit. I told him, stay, water the one-ton soup, and cook every noodle you got. In the meantime, Mike got furious because there was no food on the table for his 110 guests who were standing all over the place and on the tables and everything. So Mike rushed up to an Italian restaurant a block away and bought 50 pizzas. And he came back and started handing out pizzas to everyone. Well, everybody finally got fed, at least I think they did and they all disappeared. We, they drank all the champagne we had ordered from a nightclub up the street. And finally, at 3 o'clock in the morning, Mike got up with Liz to leave. And the manager stood there holding the bill for $700. And Mike said, yeah, bring it around tomorrow at noon to the hotel and I'll pay you. Well, as Liz kissed me, she whispered in my ear, you better get your money. We're leaving at 8 in the morning. As I said, Mike, we can't carry you. We don't belong to the diners club. Mike said, if there's anything I hate, it's somebody who questions my credit. And as Liz winked at me, Mike paid out $700. And I wished them both a bon voyage. We even had such fun fighting. We really were the most raucous fighters, no holes barred in public or otherwise. One time, Mike got three transatlantic telephone calls at once. And we got to the London airport about 20 minutes late and missed the plane for Nice. There was no other plane going. So, you know, for once, it was his fault, not mine. Well, I was teasing him unmercifully. And all these photographers and reporters were standing around. It was just a kidding fight, but we were both using old English and sort of old Italian gestures, which are even better than language. And uh, some photographer got a picture, and I think maybe it was Mike's favorite picture of both of us. Actually, I call it the only talking still picture in the world. Thank Todd. Welcome home. How was the trip? Oh, it was lovely. Thank you very much. When are you expecting the baby? Uh, well, I'm not uh, uh, actually quite sure. I haven't been to see the doctor yet. Oh, I'm going this afternoon. But uh, sometime around October, I think. Mike, there's been a lot of publicity uh, about your public spats. Yeah, I even what? heard something, something about, a, your tongue. Uh, about a champagne bottle incident. Uh, please tell oh, me about it. That is the most filthy on. thing I've ever heard in my life. I usually don't get cross. But the person that wrote this story is a frustrated old biddy who takes her frustrations out on her typewriter. And to me, it is such a sad commentary. And if anybody believes it, uh, that's even sadder. I wish everybody could be as um, unhappy as we are. Then there'd be no wars, there'd be no problems. The world would be quite nice. Would you suggest a good fight now and then to uh, married couples, Mike? 
Well, we're not introverts. We, if we have something to say, I say, hey, Liz. She always, hey, Mike. And, I, and if, if, if you make a Dreyfus case out of that, then it's too bad. But we're very, uh, well, I, I, we're, we're so happy. It doesn't uh, matter. I don't really don't care like what anybody even... thinks anyway, because we know. And we'll know well, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, if we're still alive. This babe, babe incidentally, pardon me. Oh, this babe incidentally said uh, six months or something, you know? She's been in Hollywood too long. Yeah. Well, Liz, uh, I'm quoting you now. You once said uh, you had the mind of a child in a woman's body. Am I right? That was when I was 15, yes. Sir. Oh, I see. Well, I was wondering, since you've been married to such a mat mature man of the world as Mr. Todd, you feel you've matured somewhat now? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, I'd be slightly retarded, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, thanks very much, uh, Mike and Liz, and best of luck with the baby. You see, you're not playing with children. That was a pretty good comeback. Yes, that was pretty yes. good. That was for me, not for your camera. <laughs> I decided to throw a little party. I invited only 18,000 of my very closest friends. It was the kind of a party where you have cold cuts and young people. Actually, it was quite a do. Not only did we have the 18,000 plus in the garden, but there must have been 35 million or so people that were watching at home on television. Elizabeth didn't bake the cake, but who could you find better to cut it? <laughs> well, the whole thing was an unmitigated disaster. First, there was a circus parade on 8th Avenue. There weren't enough policemen. They couldn't control the crowds, and the parade literally could not get into the garden on time, where it was supposed to go around the ring. Poor Sir Cedric Hardwick rode an elephant and almost fell off. It was absolute madness. Well, I was working the floor of the garden. And after the program was over, the food was driven in amongst the gifts. And that's when all hell broke loose. People were taking TV sets, cameras, parts of the airplane, a trailer. Saw one friend of mine drive off on a scooter. I waved to him. <laughs> it ended up with a scramble of thousands of people, all jumbled, sweating, tugging, hauling, thousands of gate crashes. And the waiters were hoarding the champagne and watering it down and selling it to people for $10 a bottle. I know. I got one of them. And the sight of chic, lacquered, coiffured, elegant women fighting with little kids over a hamburger, it was just wild. At that time, Elizabeth and Mike walked by, and Mike took the keys and he threw them up to me and he said, OK, Lenny, lock up the store. The party taught me a lesson. 18,000 gets unwieldy. Anyway, finally, Mike and I got home. The phones were ringing like mad. His friends and associates really just amplified, you know, what we'd been, what we'd seen. It was a total disaster. So Mike turned off the phone, shrugged his shoulders and said, well, they can't arrest me for throwing a lousy party. If they didn't like it, they don't need to come to our next party. <laughs> When Liza was born, she looked like, well, all premature babies, a bit like Methuselah. But to Mike, she was a total miracle. He is quite convinced that when he went to see her right after her birth, and she was an, uh, an incubator, and really breathing for her life, well, evidently in some sort of gastric spasm, a little hand came up and, and made a sort of sign and Mike was totally convinced and told everyone in the world that would listen to him that she was waving at him and that she looked him right full in the eyes and that she recognized him and waved to him. And from there on in, she, he said that she was the most brilliant child and certainly going to be the first female president of the United States and, uh, of course, the first Jewish president of the United States. Liza did and does so much resemble Mike. Of course, she was only six months old when Mike was killed. She has inherited all of his gestures, his mannerisms, his vitality, and it's scary at times, but beautiful.
On March 22, 1958, Mike flew back to New York from the coast in his private plane, the Lucky Liz. Elizabeth had a bad case of flu and didn't go with him. The plane was caught in a heavy storm over New Mexico and crashed. For five days, his death was headline news all over the world. Mike Todd died as he lived, spectacularly. His greatest legacy to me was the gift of love, knowing not only how to give, but how to receive with love.